we've got an esteemed panel taking their seats to my right hand side and as you can see behind the topic is EU and Africa players moving to Asia we're going to touch upon some of the challenges some success stories and of course because we're defining Asia as AFC affiliated we will also be delving into Saudi Arabia and Qatar as well specifically and we'll be talking about women's development as well and whether the trend is the same on the women's side. So please do interact with us. And by that, I mean take some photos and upload them on social media. And with that, I will introduce you to our panel. We've got about half an hour. Dr. Ahmed Abbasi is with us. He is on the far right. He is from the Qatar Stars League. He is the executive director of competitions and football development. In the middle, we've got Simon Colismo, former player and now the Executive Deputy General of FIFPRO. So from him, we'll get the perspective of the players. And here nearest to me is Michael Callback, not to be called Callback, I am told. And he is the CEO of Neverland Management, and his focus is Scandinavia. So Dr. Ahmed, let's start with you. Thanks for joining us here Thank at you. the World Football Summit. Qatar, of course, have been there, done that, so to speak. You've had a World Cup. Qatar Stars League has been able to capitalize on that. Now we're going to see the same sort of pathway potentially here in Saudi Arabia. What did you notice in terms of trends regarding EU and Africa-based players coming to the Qatar Stars League in the build-up to the Qatar 2022 World Cup? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here today and to talk about the shift um, and expansion of football uh, globally. We see that football, the big message that comes out of, that came out of the World Cup 2022 and, and that is also coming out from um, the changes that are happening in, in Saudi Arabia, the amazing changes that are happening here and in the region, um, is that football is not just in Europe. And we're very happy about that. I'm very excited about um, you know, the, the, the future and what, what the future um, is, is, is bringing to, um, to the region. Now, when we talk about um, players coming um, from um, Europe and, uh, and from Asia, first of all, there are a couple of fundamental principles that, um, that have to be considered. The first one is um, that because, because of the um, uh, context and the background of um, the football in the region, um, the definition of a foreign player in, 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 in the region is much different than a foreign player in, um, in Europe. And that is because in our region we have, um, in most countries, a quota for a foreign player. But what does that mean? That means that a foreign player, when he comes to the region, he is somebody who has to make a difference. It's not somebody like in, you know, when, when you go to Real Madrid and you have 23 um, uh, foreign players, they're part of the squad. But w when you're only eight, six, five, depending on, on, on the league, you are here to make a difference. So th that is the definition of the foreign player is something that is, that is crucial to understand. The second thing is, if we talk about the movement of um, European players, African players, we, we have to distinguish between two things. First of all, the origin of the players. And when we talk about the origin of the players, we see that, for example, at the Qatar Stars League, over 50% of the foreign players that play in our league come from Africa, from African origins. Only around 13% come from Europe. Around 25% come from South America. When we talk about from where they come, as in what was the, the, what was the station before coming to the Qatar Stars League, we see that more than 60% come from Europe. And we talk about the background of that in, in, in a bit. The third aspect that we have to consider is not only the players, it's also the coaches. And the coaches that come to our league now, um, if you look at um, the origin of, of, of those coaches, it's uh, uh, around 65% of those coaches come from Europe. But 50% out of those coaches that come from Europe have coached before in the region. What does that mean? There's, there are two common denominators. Dom sorry. Um, the first one is adaptation and how somebody can adapt to make a difference as a coach or as a player. But the most important one is, and, 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 and this will lead me to the trends that are happening or that happened in the last 10 years, it's the conditions. Because when we talk about making a difference and where the players come from 
and, 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 and all of that. It's to take the right decision for the clubs to bring somebody on board who makes a difference, right? And how can we do that? That's why at the Qatar Stars League, we have centralized the scouting. We have centralized the scouting to know exactly which ones are most suitable to, to adapt and to, and to make a difference. And the conditions today are the main, is the main factor why the players are so attracted to come to the region and to our league. Because we give them the best European standard uh, conditions to train, to play, to compete and to live. And this is why the, the, the trend that happened in the last 10 years uh, is actually the, 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 the turning point was when, when players had to be convinced by factors other than sportive in the past. Today, we get calls from all over the world for players and coaches who, who want to come because they know the conditions are perfect. And this is the big shift. And I think this is, th th this is what we achieved in the last 10 years. Uh, and I think the World Cup uh, and delivering the World Cup at, uh, at such a, a level showed the world at what conditions we can, we can deliver. But also from a, from a footballistic point of view, it shows that you can play at European conditions, but not in Europe. So, Simon, what we've sort of heard there is that as a league develops its infrastructure, its data, its recruitment, it becomes more stable and reliable for players. And therefore, they want to go to a place like Qatar. They know what they're in for. But when you get something that is emerging, like the Saudi Pro League, that's perhaps a bit behind in development compared to the Qatar Stars League, or alternatively, other parts of Asia that are less known to a player, how do you protect the player against a new move, potentially to a region that they are less familiar with? Yeah, thanks, um, Ben, and good morning to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think there are two parts to it. The, the, the first one is that the playing community is a very small playing community. Although there are you know, probably 60,000 professional footballers around the world, it is a small playing community. So one of the thing, first things that we do is we ask the player when they do ask these questions is to, to go out, reach out to other players, to talk to their experiences, to understand the cultural context, to understand some of the, some of the things that are in place. But just jumping on, on, on Dr. Ahmed, and, 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 and you said something really important about bringing an expertise into, into a, an emerging market, and as, as they're doing here in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, one of the keys is building capacity on the domestic level. I mean, the conditions, the conditions for a foreign player in most, in most parts when they're moving, when the eyes of the world were on Qatar, now they're on, on, on Saudi Arabia. Um, the eyes of the world are going to be here. Um, one of the key parts to having a sustainable league and one that can, one that can challenge is by ensuring that the domestic players are uh, falling within those same uh, conditions, that there is that same expertise, and you can build on this to build a real capacity to ensure that those, those foreign players that come in, they are extra to, to what you have. And I think the, the domestic playing pool is, is really, really important. Around the conditions, I think from, from a player's perspective and what we do advise the players is that you need to take the, the, the local context or the cultural context to, to first understand this. Um, wherever you go in the world, you need to respect that context. If you're an Australian player, as I was, and you go into Europe to play football, there are some things that are different to, to Australia. I mean, it was, it was over the summer. So you need to already start trying to look and understand and, and, and study that. So I think it needs to go back the other way. If a European player or a player based in Europe would like to come to the region, whether it be West Asia or, 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 or East Asia, um, finding that out is probably the starting point. And Michael, what role do agents have to play in all of this and how exciting but also challenging is it to react to a new project like the Saudi Pro League or a new market in Asia? I mean I think that the, the biggest challenge you have as an agent is that you need to prepare the players for a cultural difference. Uh, that uh, from my perspective most of our clients are Scandinavian 
which is a huge difference of playing in Scandinavia and living there compared to living and playing in Asia. And Dr. Ahmed, talk a little bit about why specifically Europe and Africa might be targeted in the Qatar Stars League. You've given that kind of breakdown and maybe historically in your more formative stages, Central and South America was very important for players and for coaches as well. Is Europe in particular more open now because your league has improved? And is that maybe why the trend is happening? It's more attractive to a European player or European-based player because your league has improved? Or is it the opposite? Has your data just opened up these new territories as being more attractive and beneficial to the league? I think, first of all, the perception has changed in the world when it comes to the region. When you ask somebody, um, a, a player in Europe 10 years ago, if, you, if they would uh, want to transfer to the, to the region when they are in the middle of their careers, they would, not, they would be very hesitant. Today, the players that we have in our league and um, the way that we, we, we're convincing them to come, like somebody like Coutinho, somebody like Verratti, uh, some, somebody who is, um, who, who is not at the end of the career, and, and still has the capacity to, uh, to, to deliver uh, performances at the, at, the, at the highest level. You have to understand how happy they are. When you ask them, how, how do you feel in the country? How do you feel in your club? They would, they would tell you, I am happy. And this is a very important point. Um, and again, we go back to the conditions. The perception now is understood that if I go to Qatar, to the Qatar Star Sea, I'll be trained by one of the best coaches in the world when we're talking about Jardim, when we talk about uh, Anthony, was the coach of the U.S. national team. Um, so the professionalism is there. The structure is there. The safety for my kids to, to live in the country is there. Um, so all, all adds up to, um, to a station that allows me to live and play at the highest level whilst being in a country that, um, uh, that gives me everything that, uh, that I want. Now, today we have to filter the, 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 the players and the coaches to choose um, the best ones to increase the, uh, the level of uh, and improve the level of, of, of our league because we have, we have so many players that want, that want to come. So, uh, um, again, the best players that perform in our, in our league are those who can adapt the best in the, in the region. When we talk about South American players, African players, they have the ability to to adapt to different uh, uh, contexts easier than other other regions, and then you have exceptions. That's why we have uh, um, we have only thirteen percent um, coming coming from Europe. But the most successful players are really those who come from Africa. For example, one of the best players today in our league is uh, Yassin Brahimi. He's an African player, comes from Algeria, played in 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 in, in Spain, France, and and in, in Portugal. He played in Porto and came to our league. So he has, he has the talent that comes from Africa, he has the physical ability, and he has the, the European school and the structure. And that adds up together with the adaptation to come and deliver and to become the best player in our league. And just to follow up before I bring Simon and Michael in, it's one thing attracting a player from Europe and Africa. It's another thing trying to keep them and make sure that the stay in Qatar isn't transient. So Xavi, for example, an amazing signing, but of course Barcelona come calling and you don't want to stand in his way. And maybe that example is atypical, but how do you ensure that players don't just come at the back end of their career or come for a short spell of time? How do you make sure that they stay for longer spells? Thank you, Ben. You, you've touched on two important points, different. Xavi, I think, is not the right example because he when we speak about Xavi, it's the second point that I will talk about in a bit. The first point is about staying in the country. And this is a phenomenon that we've seen in the last 15 years. So a lot of players that in the past we had, we had difficulties to convince and then finally convinced to come to play in Qatar, turned out to, to live in Qatar after their careers. We have a lot of players that not only stayed there for their, for their uh, uh, career, but also decided to, to keep their families there because it's safe, because it's a beautiful modern country that is developing and um, that helps them in the, in the after career to, um, to start a new life. So f for us, w w sometimes we even struggle with that. We have players that finish their contracts with their clubs 
and they struggle to find a new club, but they want to stay in Qatar. They don't want to go to another country. They don't want. They have offers from outside, and they they find it difficult to go outside because of the family, because of the 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 new life that they started there. Now, when you talk about Xavi, Xavi as a coach or uh, Taremi as a player signifies the new Qatar Stars League for us. What is it? We want to be there before, before it really happens, before the success. Xavi was not identified as a talented player in Qatar, but was identified as a talented coach in Qatar. And we have other examples like this. We have Jamal Belmadi, who is today the, the coach of the Algerian national team. We have Walid al And we have other examples that started in Qatar because we want to be a talent hub for coaches and players. When it comes to players, Taremi is today one of the most successful strikers in Europe. Where did he play before? He played in Qatar. We want to be this talent hub. How do we do this? We have a centralized scouting team with the leadership of our sportive director, Stantero Enrique, who was in, in, in FC Porto and PSG before, with a sophisticated process, with a strong team, with a, with a network, to bring those players in, to bring those coaches in. I mean, when, when we talk today about Di Zerbi, for example, everybody knows Di Zerbi, and everybody thinks it's, not, it's a no-brainer, he's one of the best coaches in the world. When you talk about Xavi Alonso, when we talk about um, um, Francesco in, in, in Nice, Today, it's clear, but if you talk about them three, four years ago, nobody believes you that this, these will be some of the best coaches in the world. And we want to be there two, three years before the others. Which I think is very smart, being ahead of the game. And no doubt you were, and the Saudi Pro League, which we'll come onto, is clearly trying to do the same thing. Simon, speak to me from the perspective of both FIFA Pro and a player as well. You've played in Asia. What goes through your mind when you move to a new territory? And then from the perspective of FIFA Pro, how do you support players in making sure contracts are watertight? And if it gets to an eventuality where they have to dispute something, they feel that they have the correct support. Yeah, um, thanks, Ben. Well, just touching on what you say, and, and, and you mentioned about coaches moving on or players, players moving on, I think that's healthy. That, that, I, I think that's a benefit to the region. I think if, if players are coming in and then going out and it's not for contractual reasons or not for these things, they are for f football or sporting reasons, then that means that the leagues here are part of the football ecosystem that do this. We see players moving all the time. From a, from a player's perspective, there's a couple of things that are, that are interesting for the region. One is, and I know it's, it's the biggest debate in world football at the moment, is player workload. Players are playing so much. We're seeing players in, in Europe playing upwards of 70 games, 75 games a year, which is just unsustainable. In the region, these leagues are growing. They have an opportunity to, to, to develop a calendar domestically, which assists the players in being able to create longer careers, to be able to play in a sustainable way. The challenge is then to the AFC. And their club competitions, and I think there's a panel a little bit later about their club competitions, their, their, their regional club competitions, how does this add to the domestic leagues to ensure that we have the best players from Qatar or the best clubs from Qatar playing against the best in Australia, the best in China and Japan and so on and so forth. And I think this is, this is a, a huge opportunity. Regarding the con contractual elements and, and, and making sure that the players, there are FIFA regulations, there are uh, DRCs and, and, and ways for players to ensure that these things um, are respected and then there are, there are pathways like there are in a, other places of the world. Um, and the reality is that, that Saudi Arabia didn't have a good reputation three or four years ago and they've started to tidy that up and they've, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they have made a lot of ground on ensuring that uh, this type of thing um, helps players come and creates that little bit of stability. Um, the contracts themselves, I mean ultimately there are standard player contracts uh, in most parts of the world. We work closely with a lot of our, our player associations which is really, really important for a sustainable league to have a player association that they can bounce things off and be able to get that domestic context with the players to ensure that these things are in place to allow for the player to turn up, 
to focus on their football, to focus on their family and, and go out and do that. But the calendar debate is a really big one for players. I mean, if, uh, and not only at the end of your career, but if you're building a career and we're seeing that players are breaking down, um, there's a lot of data out there because there are too many games, being able to, to structure that with a, with a blank sheet of paper almost is, uh, is a real positive or a real opportunity for the region. Michael, let's touch upon the women's side because many of your clients are in female football, including Nadia Nadim, who is with us here today. Is the trend the same in your opinion in women's football? Are we also seeing an influx of EU and Africa-based players to Asia? I mean, I would say that we're starting to see it. It's not uh, at the same level as the men's, not yet. And uh, I think that the women's football, if we take Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, need one player of the highest level uh, to come here. We see some decent foreign players here in the league, uh, but uh, I would say when, when a, big, a big name will come, it will open up the gate for the rest of the world and it will change, I think, the, the prescription of the, the, the league itself. And obviously, from your point of view, it's very easy for an agency to be drawn to a region like Qatar or Saudi Arabia. It's where the money is. It's where the ambition is. How do you personally educate yourself on something like the Qatar Stars League or like the Saudi League, where maybe you've not done business before and you have to learn very quickly? Were you taken by surprise by something like the Saudi Pro League or... Were you ahead of the curve and prepared for it? No, I would say that uh, it's quite hard to predict, but leading up to the Qatar World Cup, obviously, uh, it, changed, uh, it changed a lot. And uh, it didn't happen overnight, but it didn't happen uh, over, over a long pers uh, how you say it? Uh, time. Uh, sorry, I lost the word. <laughs> Uh, over a long, longer period of time, sorry. So, how to prepare? I would say it's, uh, it's what you have to do as an agent. You know, you have to identify markets. You need to educate yourself about the league, the system, how, how the football is played here, how uh, business is conducted here, and uh, yeah, and then you have to adapt. Ben, so, just just on the on on the women's space. I mean. The life of a footballer is short-term and precarious, right? Could be injuries, contracts are usually two, three years, all of this. On the women's side, it's even more so. I mean, it's not too long ago that we see that players, or we saw it at the, at the Women's World Cup recently, quite a number of those players uh, are working jobs and football is, is secondary. Now, the opportunity that presents itself in the women's space to build a sustainable league, a professional league, where it's over a calendar year or, 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 or a full season, is something that the industry is, is, is asking for. We see it in, in, in the US, in England, we're seeing it a little bit more, and now in, in Spain, I think they're probably the three leagues. Scandinavia have always been excellent uh, in this space, but there probably isn't the, the financial support as much for it. But if, if the conditions can be created for a female player to play football as their full profession and be paid like they should be. I mean, ultimately, um, they should be paid um, as the men are, but they should be paid uh, considerably better than they are now. Um, and to be able to build that and ensure that there is that um, is a really, really important opportunity. And it's another step that the region could and should take Absolutely. I think you make a very valid point. And on the women's side here in Saudi Arabia, some of you might know here in Jeddah, the al Ittihad women's manager is Kelly Lindsay, whose backstory is with the Afghan women's national team and Lewis FC, very socially activism conscious and the kind of name that wouldn't have come to Saudi Arabia unless she believed in the project and felt that it was authentic and moving in the right direction. So that's a positive for Saudi Arabia as well. We're going to have to wrap things up because we're almost out of time. So I'm going to get final thoughts from each of you. Dr. Ahmed, let's start with you. Seeing as I mentioned Saudi Arabia, 
do you welcome the Saudi Pro League? Is it mutually beneficial to the Qatar Stars League and Asian football or AFC club affiliated football? Or is it a rival in inverted commas? First of all, I want to congratulate Saudi Arabia for the changes that are happening generally. Um, and we are, we are partners in this. We are brothers in this. Um, um, we started, I think, a similar message um, 12 years, 13 years ago, when we promised the world the amazing and we delivered that. And that was a shocking uh, shift that showed the world that, again, World Cup does not belong only to certain areas. And again, Saudi Arabia today, with the, with the new Pro League, is showing that the top players can play in Saudi Arabia. What's wrong with that? Uh, and we are partners with them in this, in this change. The map, the football map, is changing. Driven by the World Cup uh, 2022, the World Cup 2034, the World Cup 2030, 26. Um, um, the changes here in the, in, in the Saudi League, the changes in, um, in the MLS, the changes at the Qatar Stars League, the UAE Pro League as well. W all of us together are, are, are driving the new movement of changing the map of football, changing the status quo of football. And uh, again, we're very proud to be part of this, and we're very proud of our brothers in, in, in Saudi Arabia for this rapid uh, uh, growth uh, that is, uh, that is uh, indeed necessary. And, and we believe that together, uh, uh, driving, driving this ball together towards um, um, the change is, uh, is the best possible way. We're very happy with this. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Appreciate your insight. Simon, final thoughts? Um, to continue to challenge the industry. I think that's what that's what this does. It, it challenges the status quo. I mean, and you can do that by by bringing expertise into the region, um, building on that, ensuring that the knowledge is being shared to the to 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 the people in the region. Um, doing that by creating more stable jobs for footballers um, and ensuring that you know their the protections, the player protections, are in place. So. The only thing a player needs to worry about uh, when they're coming in or considering coming is whether they're playing well, winning, losing, um, and doing all of that. But there, I, I implore us to to continue to challenge the the football ecosystem or the industry, the global industry. Simon, thank you. And FIFPRO are speaking also later on a panel and going a bit more in depth into some of their player findings. So please make sure that you visit us to see that presentation. And Michael, last but certainly not least, give me your final thoughts, particularly maybe about this region. Are agents and agencies and CEOs affiliated to player transfers all going to have to start thinking about using a Qatar or a Saudi as a core base? Yeah, I agree with the gentleman here, uh, what they previously say, and I also think that What's important is to strive for development. That's uh, that's what all the regions have to do to develop, not only bringing in the foreign players, but also to develop the local players. Great stuff, Paul. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for all of you for attending. They're happy to network and take any questions offline, but we'll leave it there for now. Stay around. It's not quite lunch yet, so nobody move. The next panel is ready to come straight on stage. And once again, thanks for listening.